You? Okay, uh, hi everyone, welcome to Stranger Character, thanks for coming. Um, okay, tonight's thing, as you probably know, is uh, Underground, uh, Underground, Britain Underground, Bunkers, Dirt, Concrete, Water, Drips. Um, we're going to start off with Matthew Williams, who uh, has spent a considerable amount of time um, exploring the nation's uh, bunkers, particularly military bunkers, to be fair to say. He's also, um, as, a, as an aside, he's the only person to be prosecuted for making crop circles. Well, that's <laughs> not what we're talking about. Right? Uh, he's uh, going to talk about what he does and why, um, present some slides, and then answer your questions afterwards. Then we're going to have a short break um, for you to buy beer and water and nuts and things. And then um, we're going to have uh, your Matt's uh, video footage, also a compilation of some of his explorations, accompanied by a an exclusive soundtrack by Joe Banks. Um, so this is his first new piece of sound for four years or so. Uh, and that will be followed by Paul Nomex's footage of um, a mirror grinding factory from World War II that he found on underneath the Tower of Croydon, and um, some footage and recordings from Paris's catacombs. Um, so, I think we go. Do you like that? Okay, yeah, okay. thanks. Okay, thanks. Oh, thanks uh, very much. Um, I sometimes forget my name, so that's my name. From Austin Security Service. Um, wrong slide, but anyway, Matthew Williams. Um, I'm interested in the Pro Austin Security Service because I'm interested in UFOs. I had a sighting in 1991. It blew my mind, and since then I've been looking into ways to prove the UFO conspiracy to myself and to the world. And um, I came across this place called Rudlow Manor. It was in one of Timothy Good's books. And uh, it apparently was a place that used to send out officers to um, investigate the UFO subject. And Timothy Good alluded to this from secret sources that he had inside the military. But he wasn't able to actually prove this with any factual information. It was just conspiracy information, that sort of thing. Now, what I actually did, when I was down looking at the crop circles in Wiltshire one day, um, I, it was actually Christmas Day, there's, uh, there's no crop circles around in Wiltshire then, but I used to go back and forth to Wiltshire. Christmas Day, I had a look at um, Redlow Manor with a friend of mine, and we discovered that there was a rather large security perimeter around the base, which actually extended out into all the housing and caution. And Redlow Manor, which is where Provost the Security Services are based, um, that these guys, they come out in unmarked vehicles and they check, check out registrations of cars driving through the area and sort of thing. And um, they walk around the base dressed as uh, sort of normal looking people, walking dogs, that sort of thing. And um, if, you're, if you're sort of spotted doing anything abnormal, you'll get picked up very quickly from uh, wherever you are. You know, if you sort of park in a lay-by, hide your car into by some garages, whatever. If you've been spotted, these guys will be on you in, in minutes. If you've got anything against your record as being interested in UFO research, government files, you know, whatever, you know, they'll be on top of you in, in, uh, in minutes. And we found this out, you know, because we've been looking at this stuff for quite some time. We decided to go there on Christmas Day. And for whatever reason, they were a bit paranoid, maybe about terrorist attacks, but they, um, they blocked our car off uh, with a white transit van that's sort of going towards us, came across the road, um, they got out with guns, pointed them at us, and we had to stay there and uh, endure some questions. And thankfully, I was actually, I was actually let go. Uh, we didn't have to sort of be arrested, our details checked out too much. Um, I had my uh, customs and excise ID card, I used to work for customs and excise, which I'm not proud of at all, actually. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm glad to be out of there. They, they actually sacked me because of the type of research I'm into. Um, made up charges that I've been hacking their departmental computer system. Yeah. I wish I had because maybe I'd have something to go home with. But uh, um, 
you know, I, I'm pretty certain, and everyone who knows me is pretty certain, that the reason I got sacked was because I was just an embarrassment to the department, to be honest with you. But going out and jumping over the fences at military bases and taking photos and publishing them in, you know, newsstand magazines and telling people things they weren't supposed to know. It doesn't go down well when you're supposed to be, you know, collecting taxes for customs websites. So, um, anyway, let's skip on quickly because um, that's all boring, boring crap. So, this is what you probably came for. This photo here, um, I don't know, it's not very in focus, but uh, perhaps the original was like that. I think the slide projects okay. This is Redlow Manor, the manor house. And this is a fence, and it's not a very big fence. And most of the things you'll see around Redlow Manor, if you go there, um, will be low security. It doesn't look like there's a lot going on there. And everything, you, you speak to the guards on the, the gate and you ask them what's going on, and everything you really told is, you know, oh, there's nothing going on here, it's, you know, everything's being closed down now, being sold off, and you're given a general impression that there's nothing going on at the base, really, and everything's been moved out, and pretty much it's going to be sold soon. The trouble is that if you speak to the locals, they tell you interesting stories about the underground facilities of Rotterdam. And in my investigations, looking into what they could or couldn't be doing, a la the Pro Office of Security Service and the UFO investigations they apparently uh, undertook, I found out about the bunkers. And it wasn't really something that I was looking to find out, but I found out anyway, it was just something I came across. And speaking to the locals, they told me areas where you could spot the entrances, um, emergency exits and um, sort of air shafts that go from the surface down to the underground and uh, explained to me how they worked there. People that had, had um, uh, sort of top security roles working in radio communications, in radar operations rooms, and uh, there's a, a war planning room, which is still uh, still there, although some of the base is actually, it is shut down. There are some key elements of the base that are kept running. And Rudlow Site 1, let's just see if we can get to well, these are some of the dog walkers I was telling you about. Um, it's kind of funny, you know, it's a very blurred photo, but I took it out of a moving car. I've got quite a few photos of people who look just like this, and they wear wax jackets and green wellies, and sometimes jeans or whatever, but they all look the same, and they, they're sort of wandering around the edge of the base, and some of them all with dogs. And funnily enough, they've got keys to get themselves in through security gates, so, you know, it just looks a little bit sus to me. Um, these are some of the transit vans, unmarked vans they've got there. Um, they take it, bits and pieces of that. It's all, it's all very low key. It's made to look like there's not much going on. So um, you don't see many signs at some of the key element bases that say that there's an MOD establishment behind the low fence. For instance, I'll show you a place called Caution Reader Centre, which is quite interesting. Um, what, what, how you've actually got the the, the quarries and the underground tunnels, which go underneath Red Low Manor. Um, during the last 200 years, there's been a lot of quarry work taking place um, in Caution for the Bath Stone, which uh, you may or may not know Bath, but the uh, city of Bath. Um, it's actually a legal requirement that all the buildings are built from Bath Stone. It's a creamy coloured stone, and you know it's very easy to uh, cut. It's very soft. You can even sometimes scrape it away with your finger and some of it's that soft. So they used to get this stone out from the quarries of Caution and surrounding areas, and uh, they made the whole city of Bath with it. And of course, if you look at the size of the city of Bath, and you look at how much stone there would have to be taken out in order to create such a place, and you then know that all of it, well, most of it, came from this area, um, you can imagine how much underground space there's going to be in this, in this area. And um, about the, uh, I think it's turn of the century, is it? Um, I get my facts wrong here. It's been a while since I've given this talk. I think it's around the turn of the century, um, I call it Isabel Kingdom Brunel, made this tunnel called Box Tunnel. And it comes from Box, where Peter Gabriel has his real world studios, just down here a little bit. And the main line for London, uh, Bristol through Bath to London, goes through this hill. And surprisingly enough, Sandwich, oops, Sandwich, about this level, through the, through the middle of the hill is the where the quarries start. So if you're actually going through here, from Bath to London, you'll actually be passing right underneath where some of these military tunnels are. Now, what were the tunnels used for? Um, in the 1940s, um, these quarry tunnels, which were just uh, old 
mine working dreamy uh, quarry and stone hut. We were converted, some of the better quality ones were converted for use for the military and still, um, store their uh, armament and all the TNT, missiles, grenades, bombs, things that they didn't want to have in one place, like a factory, where could, one bomb could set the whole lot off. Um, they'd store them underground at a safe facility like this. Now, in its heyday, uh, it, was, it was approximately 12,000 people worked underground. So all of this was kept secret during the war. It was a very well-kept secret. But it wasn't really a secret from people who lived in Bath and Caution or that sort of area. I mean, everybody knew that everybody else was working underground. So, so there's a lot of elderly people who still live in the area. Um, in fact, nearly everybody you speak to in the area has got a story to do with Redland. And the older people are the best ones to speak to. And they'll tell you about the wartime stories and how they dropped a, dropped a sort of uh, box of grenades and uh, it nearly went off and all these wonderful stories, you know, and, and hi uh, 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 you know, They're great to talk to because they tell you the entrances to get into the place. You know, they know all the secret entrances and, uh, and that sort of stuff. Um, so we decided to have a little look around and see what we could find. Uh, this is my friend Paul. And Yes, you have to dress in camouflage gear so you're not seen hiding in the base because they are really, they, they are quite hot on picking people up. Um, you, if you know, you, you're near the base, you're going to be spotted, so I mean, it's best to play low key. But of course, you know, it's good fun too, you know. <laughs> Maybe they think we're one of them and let us in. That's actually happened, that happened once uh, at the Caution Computer Centre. I'll come to that later on. Um, we thought, well, you know, hire an aircraft and fly over the base. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the type of thing you, you, you need to do, really, if you want to find out where underground facilities are, because they have these nice little grass verges on so many of them, and sometimes from the ground level, they're hard to spot the entrances and the places where slope shafts go in, which are usually emergency, emergency exits, steps, and, uh, and corridors, and that sort of thing. Um, that sort of thing. Now, this here, this square bit, the top is the lift mechanism for a, sh uh, a lift which can take a vehicle. Uh, you can actually see a military lorry taking up two spaces there. On well, one space, which would probably be the size of a transit van, right. could easily drive into this um, lift shaft and be taken down underground. And there are roads that go underground, and uh, it's about 25 miles of underground tunnels all around. And uh, you can quite easily get lost. Uh, we didn't know quite how easy it was to get lost until we tried to get into the place. And we found out that there's a lot of tunnels. There's a, a lot. And you can, if you haven't got a good torch and maybe about 18 or 20 hours battery life and uh, spare bulbs and water and this sort of stuff, you can really get yourself into trouble if you try to get in through some of the ways that we can, we can show you or tell you about. Uh, because it's very hard to see the differences between one corridor and another corridor and another bit of rock and another bit of mud and, and this sort of stuff, you know, on the, on the tunnels which lead up to the base. Um, you've got to use a compass and a map and you've got to have those sorts of skills really to get yourself in and out. So um, you've got to be well prepared. But um, as I say, lift shafts, these are walking uh, entrances. You can walk in either side and then this is actually a walkway. Um, we've actually seen this from the underground bit inside. And it's, it's almost like uh, sort of one-way traffic. Uh, down one side, people walk up, and down the right-hand side, people walk down. So these are for large amounts of people to leave in the morning, you know, or kind of the evening, whichever time of day they work. It was a 24-hour facility. Up until the 1990s, it was still in use. Uh, 1970s, was supposed to be about 5,000 people working there. But 1990, they reckon there was only a support staff then after that time. And the support staff are there to keep uh, the best kept secret of Rumbo Manor. Um, they're there to sort of maintain the royal family uh, bunker, which is to be used in a time of emergency. Now, we haven't been able to get into this actual part of the complex, but it's the best bit, and it's the bit that everybody wants to see. Um, of course, but um, it actually it ha it has roads underground. I told you that. But what this has is tarmac roads with um, curbs and pavements, and it has pubs, 
and hospitals and cinemas and this sort of stuff underground to apparently make it as comfortable for all the civil servants and the royal family that will be living there looking after the interests of the country should there be an emergency. Now that's kept on a care and maintenance basis. Um, <coughs> they spend about a million pound a year that they say on, on its upkeep. Right, this is um, another shot of, of the area just above the lift shaft. Um, it, and this is, uh, this is to actually obscure the view from the main road, which is up here. They built these buildings, they look like they're put in, in, in a way to actually stop you seeing bits like this. Now, even though this space is disused, you can see from the aerial shot that there's a lot of cars in this secondary security area, which only really serves the lift shaft, which goes underground. So, I mean, it's speculative evidence that there are some people who are working down underground in some parts of Spring Quarry, which is which is underneath Red Lake 2. Um, some bits which are still working are the Caution Computer Centre, the um, CDCN, which is the Command of the Defence Communications Network. Command of the Defence Communications Network is a central hub, it's the main hub for all military communications for the British Empire all across the world. Everything is controlled from this central location. It's in an underground bunker. And the communication satellites that are operated by this uh, centre are actually um, linked through a satellite dish which is not on this facility. So the wires go across country, um, tunneled through to a place called Cologne, which is a disused airbase, but much like this base, which is supposedly 90% disused. It's the best maintained disused airbase I've ever seen. And um, it's one of these things whereby care and maintenance means that it's kept on standby so that if it was ever needed to be used to get people in in a hurry to get them into the bunkers, that they could reactivate the airbase, flick the switches, and the control tower is, is then you know, back operational. So, and we've got other little giveaway signs which you only see from the air and um, you know you can drive a lorry into this one and out to the other side and uh, the lift shaft obviously taking you down underground this is still a working lift shaft and this is Rudlow site one um, you saw the earliest photo was me standing by the, the gates there looking up at the manor house you can drive along this road here yeah. um, the base actually starts at the fence line. But as I say, you know, even though there's public houses down this area, I wouldn't be at all surprised if you if you start pulling out a camera or photographing the base, even though there aren't bylaws to prevent you from doing it, um, you'd probably be pulled up and told that you weren't allowed to do it. You can challenge it and the police will usually back down. But um, you'd usually be given the sort of you're not supposed to be here, you're not supposed to be doing this treatment, but um, you can obviously challenge that. And that's a brown photo of the lift shaft, which showed you earlier on. And shutter doors there. Stop people just driving in as they wish. Um, some of the stuff we published, we put in crazy magazines like Alien Encounters. Um, unfortunately, we could never get any of our stuff in high class quality productions like 14 Titles, but uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll buy our photos, but they've all been shown uh, on text. So, probably because I can't spell. Okay. Right, that's uh, Britain's Area 51. Um, I've told you a little bit about uh, the rumours about uh, Red Low Manor having dealt with this uh, UFO stuff, but we actually found some documents which, for the very first time, uh, at the Public Records Office we found documents which for the very first time told us that Red Low Manor investigated UFOs. And it really drew attention towards the fact that Britain had its own verifiable man in black scenario, whereby men from the Ministry of Defence would go out from Rudlow Manor, they would interview witnesses, they would take their photographs and their, their statements, anything, any evidence they might have, whisk it away, analyse it, report this back up through the intelligence channels, decisions would be made as to what um, these objects were, and then the public would be told that there was stuff like weather balloons and you know, strange astral anomalies, clouds, marsh gas, whatever, but not really told what the military were being told. And quite interestingly, our 
documents that we found, the documents which belong to the Ministry of Defence that we found at the Public Records Office, clearly show that there was a cover-up on UFOs, that the public weren't being told what the military knew on the subject. And in fact, they were being played a very, a very poor line on, on the subject. And once we found these documents, they probably disappeared from the Public Records Office. Once we publicised them, talked about them in these sorts of magazines, they disappeared. And it's actually against the law for the, um, for the Public Records Office to remove the document that has now been released. So they have to be very careful what they release, because if they release something by mistake, it's too late. It cannot be taken back. But of course, we all know that you know anything the government want to do, they probably can and will do. So the, the documents disappeared because of embarrassment. Somebody might have put them out by mistake, or maybe somebody wanting the UFO research community to get hold of this information put these documents out on purpose. But whatever reason, they disappeared. So we had a wrangle with the, um, the Public Records Office. We asked them, well, where are they? And they said, well, they must be lost. Now, yeah, it's fair enough. You know, we gave them the time for them to do their checks. They had a, a document set. They have a document set every year. And they went through all their files and nothing came out, no misfiled information, so a year was wasted. And we said, well, we're not really happy with this, you know, this doesn't sound quite correct. You know, maybe we should get, um, should get a bit more pressure on this and get somebody involved, like an MP. So we got Yayan Wynne Jones to ask a question in the Houses of Parliament. And lo and behold, within two days of asking the question, the document miraculously appeared again. So we had the document back, which is of course important if you're trying to prove that I didn't just type this document up for myself. Um, it does actually exist. So we had the document back. But then, because I knew that this was too suspicious, that the document would just reappear, I rang up the Ministry of Defence, I spoke to a person in the uh, Documents File Department, in fact I spoke to the head of the Documents File Department, and he was quite matter-of-fact about saying, well actually, yes, we did have a document, all the time that you were being told that um, it wasn't, it, it, would, it would have been mislaid. And in fact, the official explanation was it had been mislaid. And he went on the record with his name and said, no, you know, that, that we had this document. I can't tell you where it was, which department had it, because that would be classified information, but I could tell you that the Ministry of Defence did actually have the document. So an MP was lied to about a document which detailed Ludlow Manor and investigations by Provost of Security Services, the STI Department of Scientific and Technical Intelligence, DI-55, Defence Intelligence 55, Air Intelligence, blah, 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 blah. All these departments were involved in investigating UFOs. Now, it rather flies in the face of some of what you might have heard about the role of somebody like Nick Pope, who worked for the Ministry of Defence, wrote a book about UFOs, wrote a few books about UFOs. Um, if in the... 50s and 60s, there were so many departments heavily interested in UFOs, and their reasons were many and varied. It seems unlikely that somebody like a desk sergeant like Nick Pope would be in heading up the whole of the UFO investigation subject for the Ministry of Defence. But I digress, because this is not going to be going off. Sorry, I've got to remember, this is not a UFO talk. This is not a UFO talk, so. Okay. Um, these are more bunkers. Bunkers. This is what you see if you get into a place called Monk's Park. Uh, sorry, Monkton Farley. Uh, empty now, empty uh, for, for, for a few years. It's been used actually in the Doctor Who uh, and Blake Seven television series. They hide out areas of the, the, uh, the underground tunnels because they look very futuristic and weird, and they have long corridors that look like spacecraft and things like that. You know, and it's it's an interest, interesting place and. Um, you can, you can sort of easily get lost in this space, but they're all, about five of these different bunker bases, Monks Park, Monkton Farley, Spring Quarry, Copenhagen, um, East Lays, five or six of these, these bases all adjoin each other. Some are connected, some are sort of not connected. You have to go onto the surface to go down into the next bunker, but about 25 miles of underground tunnels. And Um, in order to generate the power for the bases, they had submarine engines. Rudlow was famed for having uh, a nuclear submarine engine, apparently. We were told this many times by a number of witnesses that um, worked at Rudlow, that um, submarine engines are all well and good, diesel engines, but nuclear submarine engines have been in use for quite some time and require minimum maintenance, minimum amount of fuel, and actually use a very large amount of power. 
and um, we're a preferred choice for replacement in the main bunker. Um, so I'm sure the people who live in Korsha would be interested to know that they've actually got a nuclear, you know, an active nuclear time bomb underneath their village, which um, they have no right to know in the secrecy laws. So um, I'd be a bit worried when uh, you start seeing guys with white coats and guide counters wandering around the countryside, as has happened in the area. Um, I'd start to get a little bit worried. So, um, in Monk's Monkton Valley, um, you've got large air shafts, which obviously um, come from the surface to the underground, uh, protected by grills, and you have these fans, which are quite large. I think the next photo actually shows me standing next to one of them. You can kind of see a bit of hair. Um, that, you know, they're, they're very large things. You wouldn't want to sort of uh, remove that grill and get too close if the thing was fired up. There are a number of these, uh, a number of these sort of fan inlets and outlets to provide uh, sort of air for the underground base. Later on, we'll be seeing a very large one of those in flash. Um, getting down underground to have a look at the perimeters of some of the still active bases is quite hard. What you've got to do, you've got to get yourself um, hard hats, lights, um, a map, if one is available, of the existing tunnels. Very essential, a compass, that's probably the most essential thing you have along with the map, because you need to know where you're pointing, and a compass still works on the ground, whereas radios and mobile phones and pages don't. So, you know, if you get stuck, you need your compass to get you out, really. Um, and obviously water and supplies, that sort of thing. And then you get yourself near a place like the back door entrance to Spring Quarry, which is at the base of a cliff, and it's a little bit of a tight squeeze. You get yourself and your friends in there um, and start to have a look around. Now, it's been a while, it's been a while, yeah. Um, there's some unusual paranormal activity, very briefly, in this area. These, these are just one of many people I spoke to that said they had a number of strange experiences with ghosts, UFOs and things in this area. Now, of course, I'm a paranormal investigator as well as a bunker buster. Um, I was interested by how Rudlow Manor could have been involved in investigating the, the UFOs, and then there'd be so much paranormal activity in the area. I mean, what does this mean? I've been accused of saying that I believe that there are UFOs stored at Rudlow Manor. I've never said, to my knowledge, and I'd love to see where I broke this down, but I've never said to my knowledge that UFOs are at Brooklyn Manor. But they investigated UFOs at Brooklyn Manor. Uh, they've got aliens at Brooklyn Manor, but not UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, by the way. So this is the um, command of the Defence Communications Network. Uh, the defences here are a little bit more than at the, at the regular base, but there's no sign saying what this place does, and CDCN has to be deciphered for you. There's lots of places like LDC, HBGM, you know, CDCN, and you know, all of these things, you have to know what they mean, but they're quite interesting when you actually decipher them. Uh, it's just a lift shaft going down into the ground, and there's a number of people who work with the encrypted data communication systems and satellites like Skynet. Um, which is owned by the British military. So, um, this is the satellite uplink system, which is at the Colonia base I told you about. Um, these satellite dishes are uh, supposed to withstand nuclear blasts. So, quite, uh, quite impressive. That's the disused but very well maintained control tower. This is a security camera at the Caution Computer Centre. Now, this little face is a gem because high security fencing you know, and you just press the buzzer and, and uh, they let you in. You, know, you can just go in and park your car up <laughs> and then you walk down a little hedged uh, hedgerow uh, either side and you come out on this interesting, it's back to front this, mm, yes it's back to front, sorry. Um, anyway, so imagine if I'm going to sure I'm able to do that. Um, this, this little exclamation mark sign is about all that is there telling you that you're not supposed to be in this place. But I can guarantee you, when Margaret Thatcher secretly funded this, uh, this space to be built, um, they didn't want people coming near it. But to use the bluff of having the RAF bases nearby, 
with big fences, with guys who can stand on the gate. This place actually escapes nearly everybody's attention. And many of the people who live in Caution, who know about Redlow and its tunnels and what it does and the nuclear submarine engine and the, the place of the royal family where they have a cinema, they all don't know about this. A lot of people are quite surprised about this. Even Mark Thomas, who did a secret uh, bunkers feature um, recently, he didn't manage to find this place. I mean, he should have given me a call. I could have taken him on a much better tour than, uh, than he did for the TV program. Um, we got led in here by mistake. Um, we, we went in with shirts and ties, and we took an American TV program called Sightings, and they were just at the UFO angle. We took them into the space, and I said, just put your camera down by your side. So it looks like a briefcase. And we walked in, and um, as we were going into to the uh, entranceway, there's a little buzzer where you speak your name, and then glass security doors open slowly, and then you get you get inside, and they've got some um, rotating security booths. What you do is you punch your code in, swipe your card, the booth opens, you step inside, the booth closes, you punch another number in, swipe your card again, and then you let through. If any of the uh, numbers don't match, you're allowed into the booth, it closes, but if you type the second set of numbers are wrong, you're locked in the booth. So it's basically a way of securing people, you know, until the guards get there. But, you know, the whole thing is watched with cameras and this and the like. But um, we got into the second stage before we stopped, and the, the sightings crew chose to not show any of the footage on, on the TV, which I was quite surprised about. But these things happen. And I mean, it was, it was basically what the feature was about, underground bunkers and military investigation into UFOs. And then they don't show an underground bunker that they managed to get into, which is a bit odd for me. But, um, this is the entrance way. You can see Porsche Computer Center written there. And if you write to the MOD and ask them what it does, they'll tell you that it's a document storage facility. If you then write and ask her which department runs it, they say that the procurement executive in Bristol are in charge of it. If you ring the procurement executive, they say, no, it's nothing to do with us. If you actually go down into the main entranceway and push the buzzer, you get told it's a, a, a computer center for the army, the navy, and the RAF. If you speak to the guards who work at Redlow Manor, they'll tell you it's a joint command and control center for the army, the air force, and the Navy, it's a joint command centre. And I know somebody who actually worked on building this thing, and apparently it's a, it houses a supercomputer, which is on a, a rubber-mounted floor. It's a very thick rubber-mounted floor. It's designed that if a shock wave comes across the, the land from a nuclear explosion, that this thing will just basically take the rock and be able to survive, you know, an attack. And all of this was secretly funded under Thatcher's government. People mistakenly believe that this is where Margaret Thatcher and other people will be going. This is in fact a command and control centre. There will be the others, um, the, the big facility that went below Manor 2, and the um, those Burlington, which has the cinemas and all that sort of stuff. That's where everybody will be going. This is actually a command and control facility. Similar to what you have in NORAD, but on a much smaller scale, because we are only a small island after all. But, uh, most of the world. But, um, I've, I've taken TV crews here, and, you know, basically to piss them off, because they wouldn't let me in officially, so I'm like, well, if you want that being officially, I'll just take TV crews there and advertise the fact that it's there, you know, this guy's getting into the U4, um, the, the, the live files, I believe it was, on, on uh, was it live TV, you know, 24-hour titillation channel, yes, um, no longer with us, unfortunately, the, the channel anyway, but, uh, and there's one of the guys. You might see a very short clip of him later on, actually coming to close the gate, because they don't want us in there, so they come to close the gate on you, which is very quaint. As I say, the whole idea is to play down that this base is there and make a big feature of the other bases so that you don't even know this place exists. And I suppose the best secrets might be kept under, underneath people's noses, right in plain view. That's the way the British like to operate. So. This guy, Nick Redford, wrote a little bit about UFOs at the base in his book. Um, this is Mr. Nick <coughs> who wrote about his exploit at the AOD investigating UFOs, which to me seems like complete nonsense based on the government documents. Um, these are some of the names DDI Tech AI 4A Air Intelligence 5B Air Intelligence 1 Air Ministries Operations Center and Provost of Security Services. PNSS were based at Rudlow Manor up until a couple of years ago. They have apparently moved out now from Redlow Manor and they now exist at RAF Wildfoot. 
so the men in black may have left, but history goes on. And there's another famous dog walker. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> um, this is one of the documents. Uh, da -da 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 from the government <coughs> records. Signals office means communications. Communications means radio, teletype, data. Sorry. Um, these will all be handled by telephone wires, radio, satellite. And anything that comes through those three mediums is, is operated and controlled from a policy and a technology standpoint from the command of the Defence Communications Network. So teletype reports like this, which came through about a UFO sighting, would all be channeled through the command of the Defence Communications Network. And what a great place if you happen to be investigating UFOs to have a link where every bit of information comes through. It just happens to be, you know, one of the more coincidences in there. And there's the sign saying Headquarters PNSS UK, Redlow Manor. Now, this is interesting. We, we managed to penetrate a base called Monk's Park, which was apparently disused. And we wanted to find out whether it was or wasn't. So it looks disused from the outside, and it looks very low key. Uh, we took a nighttime journey, jumped over the fence, and had a look inside one of the warehouses, which, believe it or not, is open to, open to the air. You can just walk in. There's no security, there are no cameras, there are no guards, nothing. We just walked in and we thought, well, this is great, you know, we've got um, this warehouse, you know, and maybe it'll lead to an underground tunnel. And it, it actually did. We found uh, that there was a very large, very large railway car system which went down a slope shaft and it took vehicles sideways down into the ground. And you could get something like the size of a small lorry on this, on this, um, can, uh, this uh, rail car thing that goes down into the ground. Now, we thought, well, great, we'll walk down the track into the underground facility. And as we stepped over the threshold, we broke a beam sensor that was there, and we set off the alarms. Now, my attitude in situations like this is, well, let's run in. You know, my friend's attitude was, let's run out. And I was like, you know, come on, how many chances do you get to be this close to something that you want to see? You know, you've got to go in, you know, and then see what you see and get arrested, but you know, can't take away what you've seen. So that's great, and I sort of convinced him at first to come and have a look. So we got down underground and we saw some of the areas like have roads and sort of stuff. And then we started seeing crates and boxes which had manifests which had been printed within the last week. So there's a lot of stuff coming and going from this place. And then this, this place was like um, a scene out of the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Hour, where they've got these things stacked up, you know, and it's just like corridors and corridors full of boxes. And I had to say, you know, I thought to myself, well, if they did want to hide something really strange in this world, you know, having a, a huge facility, you know, miles long, full of boxes which say things like screw, screw nuts for Your Majesty's warship, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like copper, copper pipe for this. Or something like that. You know, it's like, well, what is it in, in fact inside that box? And I, I didn't have the time or the energy or didn't want to actually commit any real criminal acts by opening the boxes. But there were a lot of interesting bits of hardware in the ground, satellite, um, radio equipment, electronic stuff. Um, much of which we've been told now is surface equipment, it's not actually active equipment. But, you know, we were told this was a disused base, but in fact it was actually a very used base and it was used for storing parts for the military. So. Anyway, we, we set off these alarms and then we were running around the underground and, you know, we were looking for exits to get out, places to sort of break into other, ground, other underground tunnels so that we could sort of head off and maybe see how far we could get. And um, we started to hear noises. It seemed like somebody was coming down into the facility. So we hid ourselves in some boxes. We waited for about four hours until... <laughs> as you do. Well, you know, just, just until they, they went, you know, we wanted everyone to, to leave us alone so we could make our way out quietly. And we, we waited until we heard what sounded like a lift shaft going back up, this, 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 kind of this car thing going back up. And then we sort of sneaked around to the main entrance and um, 
we, we thought, well, you know, something that looks see what's going on. We could hear voices on the surface, and then we started hearing what sounded like gunshots of two types, shotgun and semi-automatic rifle. My friend swears that, that what he heard was a shotgun. Now, my friend was very, very perturbed by this. <laughs> very perturbed. And uh, I, I dare say, he might have changed his, his, his position on it now, but it was his first time going into a bunker, and he sort of came at the, the, deep, the deep end. And um, at the time, he wanted to give himself up. Um, I wouldn't let him do it. I said, no, 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 no. You know, we've got a chance here to get out with our camera and take some photos. You've got to give this the chance, you know. And he was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And I was like, come on, you know, let's, let's just have some fun and see what we can do. So, uh, this, this is actually the way in. This is just before we jumped over the, the bit. And believe it or not, if we've been clever enough to realise it, this is the infrared sensor that goes across there. So once we climbed onto this, get up there, um, and you can see the slant operates at that level. You could, you could drive a vehicle onto this sideways, reverse it back and you know, manipulate it, whatever. Then the gate raises up to stop anybody getting on or off, and then the whole thing goes down into the ground. It's quite, quite, a, large, quite a large piece of equipment. Uh, that's the shaft, and there's the car at the bottom of the shaft. And it doesn't look very long here, but it is a, it's a very long shaft, and that's a very big car. A really big car. This is uh, Richard, a bit out of focus. It was, it was a bit dark in the ground, so I wasn't able to focus very well. Some lights were on, some lights were off, so he's a bit out of focus there. Um, there we are, symbol, crates. It's Mark Pilkington, it's a younger Mark Pilkington. Um, so the crates stacked up there, and um, yeah, just roads going off into the distance. It's an immense facility. And as you can see, you know, sort of road signs and things saying slow down. Little checkpoints and places where they, you know, it looks like they'd stop. People have cups of tea and that, that sort of thing. You know, it's places for people to recreate whilst they work underground. And I believe that's the end of the slides. So um, that that's just some, a little snippet of what I've what I've done at Ludlow Manor. I've actually penetrated the main facility, which is called Spring Quarry. And we penetrated that um, about four years ago. And pretty soon after we did that, there was a book was published by a guy called Nick McCamley. It was called Secret Underground Cities. I do recommend you have a look at that book because it goes into great detail about just how many people did work underground and what they did in the wartime. Um, after Nick McCamley's book, that Channel 4 and ITN were invited to go down into the Spring Quarry system. Now, there'll be a bit of video footage of this later, but I, I must sort of say that, you know, we, we've been actually into the facility before anyone was allowed into the facility, so, you know, I think we, we were quite lucky to get in and get out before, and maybe some of that actually had uh, an effect on allowing Channel 4 and Nick the Camley to, to go in, because once your secret's lost, there's no point in really keeping it there, maybe. But um, some of that footage will be shown with the person who's... Uh, going to give us some musical entertainment, but what are we doing time-wise? Um, we'll take some q &A. Yeah? Okay. If anybody's got any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Um, yeah, we'll do some q and We'll do some q and Okay, thanks. Oh, yeah, questions or comments? Do you believe? Do you believe me? The proof is in the screen. <laughs> Oh, the Photoshop as well, isn't it? Let me just put myself in. Yes. Um, <coughs> do you know anything about when an air shop did near Checkers and Buckinghamshire? Checkers and Buckinghamshire. I don't, but I'd love to. Well, it's uh, an air shop on top of a hill. The hill's got a fence around it. Right. And then some friends are turning it out in one day. Yeah, well, air shafts are often for underground tunnels. The bigger the shaft, the, the larger you could probably imagine that the underground tunnel system could be. Um, you sometimes get railway lines that go through hills, much like a box tunnel, and they have air shafts that go to the surface to actually release you know, gases and things like that. But uh, if you can't actually see any railway stuff going into the hill, the chances are that what you're doing is in that place. I'd look for entrances on the lower sides of the hill. So if you imagine that the highest point is where your air shaft is, Go to either side, walk, walk the perimeter, and look for small entrances around. It's not impossible that some bases do actually have an entranceway way off site that goes down, goes way across country, up into, up into a hill, and up into the centre of the hill, 
but I mean, you'd never find the entrance around the edge of the hill because there's very long walkways that come from other places back into the centre of the hills, and such as there's uh, one you can pay to get fit into called Kelverton Hatch, and that's um, another war planning bunker, government bunker, which is near Kelverton Hatch. Brentwood. Brentwood. You've been to it, have you? I want a party in there. You want a party in there? Excellent. They're good, aren't they? It's just, except when you have a fire, you sort of look everybody can't get out and they rust. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're actually quite bad for that, bunkers. They're, they're places that are very paranoid about having fires because fire gets through there very quickly and the oxygen gets uh, starved and, and people have problems. And the cautionary descent is interesting because um, the staff who work there are well aware that if there's an emergency, uh, the fire brigade and themselves, they have to use the only method of entry and exit, which is the lift shaft. Now, as you, everybody's told, don't use a lift shaft in a fire. But that's the only way in and out for these people if there's an emergency. The fire brigade have to enter that way as well. So it's kind of interesting. Has anybody got any questions? <coughs> spring quarry, yes. Um, well, spring quarry was used for ammunition storage. Um, the best stories I've heard include that it was used for nuclear weapon storage for a small amount of time in the 80s. Um, the facility is mostly disused, as I say, but it adjoins. Burlington, which is still operational, Burlington is actually directly beneath Rudlow Site 2. So if you get to the main guardhouse of Rudlow Site 2, right to, well, to the left of it, you can actually see a triangular shape of grass verge, and that's the entrance to Burlington. And any of you who's got the guts to climb the fence, right in the view of the guardhouse and, and try and get in there, I'd be interested to see some video footage. Uh, does that answer your question? I mean, have you got a specific area of Spring Quarry you wanted me to answer something on? Because I'm not. Sorry. It is the seat, national seat of government. Yes, yes. Um, under the war plans, which are secret and they're not allowed to look at, which include wonderful things like, you know, if uh, there's a nuclear war, the public may have to be uh, sent off to areas that are highly radioactive to kill them off because we can't afford to feed them and use medical resources so we we'll lie to them and we'll send them to their deaths and any of the stragglers that are left behind we'll put um, traffic warden, we'll give traffic wardens guns and then we'll run and kill, kill people and things like this. The war plans, they're great, you should read them, you know, it's like science fiction except it could one day be you know, the, the last thing uh, that ever affects your life. But um, yeah, the, the, the headquarters for government would become Burlington may not be the only place where they've got this, because of course if you bomb one site and you lose, lose uh, the ability to use it, you might need to have another one and another one. Apparently London itself has a very large system of underground tunnels. London has a city underneath the city. And, um, you know, you've got war planning offices and uh, the, the tunnels beneath Parliament and all that sort of stuff. Croydon is interesting because uh, somebody is going to be talking about the Croydon underground bunker, which was a... Um, Mirror power ecology facility. I've never heard this before, so I'm going to be interested in myself. But what I did find out about Croydon is underneath the council offices, there is a bunker system which the council will and won't talk about. It, you know, it depends who you speak to. But um, it's still operational, and it appears that it might be used by either a, a branch of the police or the intelligence services because they're down there with computers and screens and stuff. And somebody I know stumbled upon stumbled upon an entranceway for it. It actually got uh, told off. He worked for the council. It doesn't work for them now. But uh, stumbled across a doorway in the basement of the library, the Croydon Library, which is called the Clock Tower. And he was like, "What does this door go to?" He opened it. It was like a tunnel. He was like, "Well, what does this door go to?" And then he was like playing with his one door, and he couldn't get it open. And as he turned to walk away, it opened, and there's screens and computers in there. And he told me about this, and he said. Yeah, the lift shaft in the Croydon clock tower, have a look, he says it's got a keypad and a swipe card. He says, and if you've got the right key and swipe card, you don't go up to the second floor, you go down and you get into the, 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 the thing. So go in, have a look in the Croydon clock tower. Well, there's a lift shaft and go in and have a look, there's one with a swipe card and a button thing. Is that how the door is? It goes, well, that isn't the doors he saw because he went into a basement area and from the basement there was a tunnel. I don't know. He wouldn't let me do it. My friend wouldn't let me do it because he was, he was in fear of his job. But now that he's not working there, maybe I should give it another look. Yeah. 
Uh, a week or two ago, our good friend MTK, amongst uh, their gratuitous linkage, posted mm -hmm. a link to the report by two kids who went um, down to the uh, disused platform, a whole board tube station, not mm -hmm. from here, and from there up the track um, towards where uh, Aldrich Love Disused Station used to be, went past a disused train, found a disused platform, and had photographs of what looks like the entrance to this museum. Excellent. Uh, I'm suggesting going down there now. Like, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I just was coming up. I went past where the entrance to that bathroom used to be, and it was a, a, a very tame grill, and there's now a big fit security door. How did you get into the hope of the two over the discussion? He was walking up the track. Yeah. Uh, I've heard these stories, they are, they are true, they've got um, underground uh, sections of railway which are specifically for use in time of emergencies, and they've got areas which were used during the war for, for sort of people to um, shelter and things like that, which were never really reopened with this sort of stuff. They've had areas which were specifically built on the underground system, up to Calverton Hatch for instance. Uh, Calverton Hatch was built because it needed to get a train to the bunker as near as they could to the bunker. And that's the only reason the railway was extended, apparently, to Calvin and Hatch, was for that. The, the, hatch in 93, the, uh, the railway was no longer used. Out there, there we go. Yeah. Interestingly enough, in the video footage later on, you'll see inside a bunker in Preston, there's a big map on the wall, and it shows the areas defining the wall planning sections. Now, it was well known back in councils that although constituencies were sort of apparently uh, selected and uh, chosen and decided upon amongst councillors, that that wasn't actually true, that's what the public were told. The truth was that the military chose the defining areas and it was all to do with the war plans. So, you know, Lancashire and Cheshire would be different, you know, areas war planning wise, not because of the council's wishes. This was all because of war planning, not because of, you know, politics and votes. One last question, please. Um, one of the bunkers you're talking about are around Bath. Is there the yeah. most bunkers in the country in that area? Or no, there's bunches all over the country. These sites, well, they have a lot of radar bases. Yeah, the, the radar bases are still there, the underground stuff on the East Anglian coast and all up there. They're, they're still there, but there's quite small places like um, RF Oak. There's Oak Hangar, which is, again, part of the command of the Defence Communications Network. It's a link up station. Um, you've got uh, underground stuff between beneath Goon Hilly, Dover. You know, Dover has underground tunnels. Um, you know, every city has an underground tunnel system and a bunker system. Uh, the military own the biggest ones. The councils have the smallest ones because the military would rather be in charge of the country rather than the councils. Um, so they make sure that they have the biggest bunkers. But um, a lot of this is being kept secret because they don't want people trying to get into the bunkers and there be an emergency. That's why it's kept secret. Unlike Switzerland, which guarantees every every citizen a place in the bunker, which is a mountain, which has actually been hollowed out, and it's a huge thing. It's not a secret either. It's, it sounds like science fiction. Um, we don't we don't hear a lot about it for some reason, but I think it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, they've got a hollowed out mountain, and every person who lives in Switzerland is guaranteed a place in this bunker, and they will survive. So we'll all be Swiss after the Holocaust. <laughs> Listing them or leasing them? Uh, less listing, you know, like the national heritage. To keep listing them, to keep yeah. them as, as they're meant to be, yes. I haven't, I haven't heard of them thinking of doing that, but um, yeah, it would seem that they are national treasures, but um, the trouble with bunkers is, no matter whether you tell people where they are or you keep them secret, they can always come back into activation. Mm -hmm. So anyone who buys a bunker, or anyone who's living in a bunker or whatever, you know, will always have to have a clause in their agreement of purchase that says that the military can come and take it back if they want it. So that's always something to be borne in mind if you're thinking of purchasing a bunker, is that it doesn't actually really belong to you. So thanks very much, and uh, I'll hand it over to the people.